You're watching ESPN College Football Primetime, presented by Hampton Hotels. From Owen Field at Oklahoma Memorial Stadium, it's the Cornhuskers of Nebraska against the fourth-ranked Sooners of Oklahoma. Good evening, everybody. Mike Patrick, Todd Blackledge. It's great to have you with us. Oklahoma has a tremendous offense. They're averaging 48 points a game, number two in the nation. Even in their only loss to number one Texas, they still racked up 35 points. And this is not a one-trick pony. This is a very balanced offense. Yeah, I think, Mike, they're the best offense that I've seen this year live or on tape. And what makes them so special is their versatility. It all starts up front with Oklahoma. They've got a big, strong, athletic, and experienced offense line so they can run power football and really come after you then they've got skill and speed on the outside and a Heisman candidate quarterback so they can spread out and throw the football with great effectiveness and because of Sam Bradford's ability to manage the game they can also really up the tempo on you they don't play with a huddle and they can really play fast and continue to put the pressure on a defense I think the only thing that can stop the Oklahoma offense right now is the Oklahoma offense I think you're right too the there are so many outstanding quarterbacks quarterbacks in the Big 12 conference this year. It's unbelievable. You know most of them, but yeah. even for the ones that the fans don't know, like Nebraska's Joe Gans, it doesn't mean he's not a tremendous talent. No, he's a fifth-year senior. He's only making this 12th start, but I'm really impressed. What I've seen on tape, I like this guy. And over the last three weeks, I don't know that anybody's played any better in college football. And I, I asked him yesterday, do you feel like you're a little underrated? And he said, well, it's a pretty good league to be underrated in the Big 12. And I agree, but I think Joe Gans, because of how he's played and the confidence he's playing with that gives Nebraska a chance in the ball game tonight this is a huge rivalry of course but tonight something of a homecoming atmosphere Holly Rowe has more on that and Mike you're right down on the field during the pregame it didn't seem like OU Nebraska it seemed more like a high school reunion there are so many ties on these coaching staffs most notably head coach Bob Stutes of Oklahoma is from Youngstown Ohio well so is Nebraska's Bo Pelini they're almost like brothers this is the first time they're facing off against each other as head coaches especially on rival schools guys there was a lot of handshaking lots of smiles pats on the back before the game but I talked to Bo Pelini I said is this going to be strange he said it is a little bit strange it's different from our days growing up together but tonight it's professional we just have to take care of us and Holly the kickoff will change everything and the kickoff is next ESPN's college football primetime brought to you by Allstate proud sponsor of college football and the 75th Allstate Sugar Bowl are you in good hands and Edward Jones making sense of investing Football goes back a long way to 1912. Oklahoma leads the overall series. They've won the last three. And they played every year between 1927 and 1997. But now with the unbalanced conference schedule, they no longer, no longer play every year. What a shame for college football fans. Take a look back at some of the most memorable moments in this rivalry on our show tonight. We'll also explore Bob Stoops and Bo Pelini's unique relationship when we play Did You Know? And the taste of the town storms into Norman, and Todd is able to experience barbecue for all age groups. You like that? You can catch Taste of the Town at the end of the first quarter. Adi Kanalik, one of the best kickoff men in college football. 22 touchbacks and 48 kicks. DeMarco Murray, number seven. Joaquin Iglesias, number nine, are deep to receive. Hoping they get a chance, but this guy has a great leg. Number one in the country a year ago. 
42 percent plus of his kicks were not returned. This one will go almost four yards deep. Murray has a seed. Inside the 40-yard line, a 64-yard return. DeMarco Murray with his longest return of the year. Well, I was just about to say, that's good for Nebraska to kick it out of the end zone. Make Oklahoma work on a long field as much as you can. And right away, DeMarco Murray shrinks the field for the Oklahoma offense. And, and there's a flag yep. down. Dead ball foul. Personal foul. On the offense, number 84, 15-yard penalty. First down. That's on Quentin Chaney, one of the starting wide receivers. So that will back them up, but it doesn't matter how far yeah. you kick it, apparently, if you got a return man like that. Sam Bradford will come out. He has been brilliant this year as Oklahoma's sophomore quarterback, third in college football and pass efficiency, is rating over 185. He has 29 touchdown passes, only five interceptions. Only a sophomore. Murray will get the first carry and almost made it back to the line of scrimmage. Tyler Workman on the tackle. You can check out both lineups at the top of your screen above the scoreboard. The strength of the Nebraska defense is their front four. They're down linemen, and they've got to play big tonight. Bradford, nice play fake. Nobody out there with him. Floats it downfield and has the completion inside the 20-yard line. A perfect strike to Ryan Broyles, the redshirt freshman speedster. Second play of the game, they go play action, and you see the ability of Sam Bradford. It's a rollout to his left, a right-handed quarterback, and he just throws a beautiful pass on the move down the left sideline. Not an easy pass to make. Royals is the speed they were looking for. And around to Johnson. They go into the bag of tricks early. Johnson tackled at the 11. After a gain of about two, Tyler Workman again on the tackle, and Johnson has to get reshot. And we mentioned Oklahoma goes without a huddle. That doesn't mean they go hurry up all the time, but they give you that appearance that they're going hurry up all the time. They always have the capability of lining up and going on the first sound. Right now, you see all the skill guys looking over to the signal, and then the quarterback, Bradford, communicates to the five offensive linemen. Just put so much pressure on the defense. Murray. Cuts it to the outside. Near the goal line. They'll mark it about a foot away. And DeMarco Murray, 6'1", 205, pounds his way near the goal line. DeMarco Murray, the last couple weeks, has really come on. Following his block in there by the right guard, Brandon Walker, number 73, kind of led it up into the hole on that time. Did a nice job of being patient and sitting behind the block of Walker. Nebraska tried to run a player on. He got back in time. Murray dives, didn't make it. It'll be interesting to see if Nebraska only had 10 guys on defense that time. Because one is coming yep. on and nobody's coming off. They stopped them with 10. Well, again, the strength for Nebraska is up front. But Oklahoma starting with the short field right there inside the two-yard line now. That'll lose a yard, maybe a yard and a half. And Nebraska rising up on defense, trying to keep Oklahoma out of the end zone. Bo Pelini knows for his team to have a chance tonight, that defensive front has to play well. They've got to hold their own against a very good Oklahoma offensive line. It starts inside with the tackles, Sue and Steinkuhler. They're the two big guys on the inside. Tight formation again. Chris Brown is now the tailback. Brown will get the carry off the right side. Touchdown. Good block by the fullback, Matt Clapp. Nebraska held twice. They couldn't the third time. And there is Clapp out of Phoenix, Arizona. 6'3", 234, and he led Chris Brown off right guard for a touchdown. They got a nice block on the linebacker, Cody Glenn. Put his helmet right in his chest, and then Brown able to fall him into the end zone.
But we always talk about the underdog needing to have things go right and go right early. Not yet. Oklahoma's on top 7-0. Hi, I'm Barry Switzer, former coach of the Oklahoma Sooners. Today you'll be watching two teams possess one of the greatest traditions in college football, Oklahoma and Nebraska. Oklahoma has won more football games than any team the past 60 years, including seven national championships along with 41 conference championships. Check the record. They plan to win another one today. Thank you, Coach. The bootleggers boy knows all the numbers, doesn't he? He helped rack up a lot of those. He did. Well, Nebraska, knowing coming into this game, they can't give up big plays and easy scoring drives like that first Oklahoma drive. They gave up the big kickoff return and the 41-yard pass from Bradford, and all of a sudden, before people even get in their seats, it's 7-0. Moreland to kick to Niles Paul. Good kick by Moreland. He's seven yards deep, and they'll take it at the 20. Joe Gans is a senior. In his last three games, he is really making a statement. Over 337 yards a game, three straight 300s, completing almost 75% of his passes, six touchdowns and only one interception. You've watched him a lot on film yeah. getting ready for this game. I was really impressed by how much you liked him. I really do like him. He's accurate. He's mobile. He runs well enough to make some plays. And the best thing he does is he has the ability to extend a play. If the protection breaks down, things don't work all that well, he has the ability to extend the play and make plays down the field and very much in control of this offense. Marlon Lucky is the eye back, and that one is picked off. It'll go for a touchdown. Dominique Franks. Six. He read it all the way. He got a great break on the ball. And holy cow, what a hole they have dug in the first two and a half minutes. Well, Brent Venables, the defensive coordinator, knows that Nebraska has liked the quick screen. A lot of times it's off of a run pass check at the line of scrimmage by Joe Gant. And they guessed right. Dominique Franks was looking directly at the quarterback and just guessed perfectly. He ran it like it was his pattern. The point after is good. Two touchdowns in four seconds. Yikes. Well, here's Dominic Franks right here, and he is looking in at the quarterback right now, and he's guessing that Joe Gann sees too many guys to run inside, and he checks to the quick throw, and he just makes a direct line to the path of the throw. He was well coached, mm. and he guessed right, and now it's 14 to nothing instead of 7 to nothing after two plays. That's just a great play, yeah. and that comes from homework. Well, it does, and, and Nebraska loves to throw that wide receiver screen when the cornerback is off. And so the read was there, but they kind of baited Joe Gans into making that throw. You always want to get your quarterback comfortable, yeah. something easy, and if the defense has seen it enough times, they can make plays like that. So we'll have to do it all over again. And Bo Pelini, all he can do is shake his head now. He's down 14 nothing. He's telling, them, all right, everybody calm down. But the butterflies are flying in formation right now. Paul is deep again. And this one will go out of bounds. That's a big error on the kicking team. Gives Nebraska the ball at the 40 yard line. Check in with Holly Rowe. Well, after that quick interception and touchdown, Joe Gans ran over to the sideline. Remember, he's a senior. The first guy that met him was his head coach, Bo Pelini. Bo got in his face and said, that's okay, we'll get it back. I wouldn't say there's panic on the sideline right now. Maybe a little disbelief. Joe just kept shaking his head. His teammates kept shaking their head. But guys, they've got a resiliency right now. They're just going to run back out and try it again. Well, that's all you can do. I mean, you've got a whole football game to play. I mean, we've still got 12 minutes left in the first quarter. So uh, 
you can't look at the scoreboard right now. You've just got to stick to your plan and try to play football. And this is a good offensive football team in Nebraska. Lucky. Continues to fight, picks up about four. One of the things that Nebraska has done extremely well this year is possess the football, particularly the last three weeks against Big 12 competition. They've run over 100 more plays than their opponents, and uh, they could use that right now. Take the crowd out a little bit, get a nice drive going, score some points, give their defense a chance to get their feet on the ground. And Joe Gantz is the right kind of quarterback for this situation. I really believe that. Oklahoma shows a four-man rush. Gans good play fake on the run. Throws complete and then dropped. Drew Young, the tight end. And they're going to roll it a fumble and give the ball to Oklahoma. Keenan Clayton made the hit. Be interesting to see the replay on this. Now, it looked like he got his feet down, but it looked like he may have been bobbling it on the way down. Great hit by Clayton, up high, right at the ball level, chest level. Boy, and, that's close. And everything that Nebraska could not afford to have happen, they give up the opening kickoff, yeah. return, and now two turnovers in their first two offensive possessions, not the way you come in and play Oklahoma. Three snaps, two turnovers. Yeah. I mean, this is just devastating. And now, we're going to take a look at this a little closely. Well, it was ruled a, a fumble on the field. He was juggling the yeah, ball, he, it he appeared. Was, he was, it appeared he was juggling the ball. You have to have control for it to be a catch. He tucked it, but did he have one, only one foot on the ground? Did he have one step after he juggled it? Is it a catch? They're taught to rule if it is very close to air on the side of an incompletion. But it was ruled yeah. a catch and a fumble on the field. It looked to me like he, when he was trying to tuck the football. Field stands. First down. It doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> <laughs> They're ruling on the field stand. It, it looked always like he was matters trying. what yeah, you well. think, pal. It looked like when he was trying to tuck it, he also knew he was going to get hit and try yeah. to protect himself. Yeah. And the ball never got tucked cleanly. But don't take anything away from Oklahoma. It was a nice hit by Clayton. It was. And they've got the football again. What's next for Nebraska? Locusts? Hmm. Chris Brown will get the assignment at tailback to start this series. And all that friendship stuff aside, if Bob Stoops can put another one on here quick, he will. Complete down to the 46. Cheney makes the catch, and Matt O'Hanlon made the tackle. Oklahoma pulling out all the stops. Iglesias on the end of the round. And goes down at the 39-yard line. That's enough for a first down. Anthony West made the tackle there is a flag down this could be a hold yeah this was the first time that we saw oklahoma line up and snap it quick again they always have that ability holding offense number 84 10 yard penalty from the spot of the foul first repeat second down that's cheney even though the play comes back they they had nebraska in a position there because nebraska was trying to adjust to the formation they had linebackers kind of muddled together in the middle and they ran the reverse out the outside and had a big play, but brought back by the penalty. This defense for Nebraska, far better than it was a year ago, but still not where Bolpolini wants it or where he will have it based on everything he has done in his past coaching history. Well, I think he's a little bit limited, too. I mean, personnel-wise, he's not able to do everything that he's comfortable doing. Obviously, three years at LSU, he had great personnel. Bradford with all day to throw. Chancey right down the middle. Asante and Hanlon, the safeties, he carved them up. 
And Bradford was perfect. He got the protection. He got the coverage I think he was looking for. His receiver went right down the middle and threw a perfect pass. And he did a great job with his eyes of holding the safety in the middle of the formation so the safety couldn't come over to help on the inside receiver. We have played four minutes and 29 seconds, and it's 21-0. Did we say Oklahoma needed a fast start? I don't think so. ESPN's College Football Primetime is presented by Hampton Hotels. Hey. At Hampton, we love having you here. And in part by the new Hyundai Genesis. It all starts with this. <laughs> that was our Halloween bowling party last night. And uh, our Holly Rowe was responsible for designing everything. Here's Joe Pa. The lake's still <laughs> bothering him. <laughs> oh, we had a ball. Thanks to Holly yeah, Rowe for fun. doing all the work to set that up. I think we <laughs> ought to go right now and have another one. 21 nothing, and we just started. Niles Paul backs up to the three. And is engulfed at the 16. Well, I'm going to go back to the touchdown. I don't want to pick on this guy, but Larry Asante, who you're going to see right here, the free safety, is the guy who's going to get taken advantage of a little bit by Sam Bradford. Watch Bradford. Now, right now, he's got him frozen right here, and he's going to throw the ball here, and as long as he keeps him there, he won't be able to come over the top and help on the play. He holds him in the middle and then throws right in between the corner and safety for a touchdown. I mean, that's beautiful work by the quarterback Sam Bradford with his eyes and with his arm. Gans now facing a massive uphill struggle and they're not even warmed up yet. Lucky drives his way out to the 19 and for the first time tonight here's Reese Davis. Reese. Hello Mike you guys off to a quick start so too is Texas Tech. You're looking at Colby Whitlock he just tackled Chris Obanaya in the end zone and the Red Raiders with a 2-0 lead in Lubbock on ABC against number one Texas and Tennessee just looks awful. South Carolina killing him. It's 21-0 halfway through the second on ESPN2. Wow. All right, Reese, you said 2-0 Texas Tech. We were 2-0 before we kicked off. Gans with time tipped okay. in the air intercepted. Holmes looking for a block to the 10, to the 9. Whatever can go wrong already has. And what did Bo Pelini tell us last night at the hotel? All I want is for us to play the best game that we've played so far this year, to take another step forward. This has been nothing but steps backwards. It was not a good throw by Gans. Lucky not able to catch the football was kind of behind him and high and then it whenever that ball gets tipped up in the air usually something bad happens and uh, boy for Nebraska it just can't get any worse than it is right now. A return of 25 yards. DeMarco Murray will be the tailback. They have four wide receivers. And another touchdown for Oklahoma. That's Jermaine Gresham, the tight end. Well, he's a real matchup problem because of his size. He's 6'6", 260. He was in the slot. No pressure on Bradford, and you see the accuracy. I mean, this kid can really throw the football, and he's got weapons all over the field to throw to. Gresham working on the safety. Easy touchdown for the Sooners. Well, we may be looking at records here. Well, they scored 55 in the first half last week against Kansas State. 
But we're not talking first half. We're talking five minutes and 33 seconds. Holy cow. When we come back, did you know that Bob Stoops and Bob Polini, as well as they know each other? Well, we'll find out when we play Did You Know? We are back in Norman, Oklahoma, where the Sooners are on a pace to score 154 points in the first half. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, they're they're gonna have they're not hardly breaking a sweat, but they're gonna have no. to get oxygen for those ponies that pull that <laughs> wagon that come out here, because I don't know how they can make it. ESPN's college football primetime available in sparkling clear ESPN HD, and you can see what's happening in this game with great clarity already. Every break has gone Oklahoma's way, and as good as they are, they don't need him. Nebraska was the team that needed the breaks. This kick will go five yards deep. Niles Paul will bring it up. Has the same good return up to the 29. Did you know that Bob Stoops and Bo Pelini are both natives of Youngstown, Ohio, and graduated from the same school, Cardinal Mooney? Stoops graduated in 78. Pelini in 1986. And these families, as we have found out over the years, a lot of families in yeah. Youngstown have been intertwined, great friends yeah. as family groups play pickup games against each other, particularly right after Thanksgiving when everybody would be home. Quentin Castile, the new eye back, he'll get the ball and lose about two. Yeah, there were there are five Stoops brothers and I think eight Polini children, five boys. And uh, of course, there's Carl Polini, one of Bo's brothers, who's the defensive coordinator. And Bob Stoops' father was the defensive coordinator at Youngstown Cardinal Mooney for 23 years before he died and uh, coached all these guys. And so, yeah, not only did they play football together, but as you mentioned, those pickup basketball games at St. Pat's Gym uh, <laughs> over Thanksgiving. No blood, no foul. Knockdown, drag out affairs. All they, the kids in the neighborhood. They made them sound very <laughs> evil. Yeah. Gans throws underneath. This ball was tipped up in the air, almost picked again. Holy cow. Austin Box, the starting middle linebacker, was trying to keep that thing alive. Let's check in with Holler. Well, guys, you know these families must be close because when Bob Stoops and his wife Carol first got married, he was a young coach just getting started. Well, he hired his graduate assistant, Carl Pellini, to come and coach for him. But, you know, graduate assistants, they don't make any money, so he let Carl live with him and his wife. They were newlyweds. It was kind of like you, me, and Dupree. He said, hey, it was great for my wife to have somebody to talk to. I was at work all the time. <laughs> Football coaches are a different breed, aren't they? Gans looking at third and long. Pressure coming. Stands in the pocket and throws, and too high, incomplete. Intended for Todd Peterson. Youngstown must lead the world in coaches per capita. <laughs> I mean, they have just produced so many different guys. There's Bo and Carl. Tim Beck, the Nebraska running back coach, and Bob Stoops, the obviously the Oklahoma head coach, all from Cardinal Mooney. Yep. And what's the school across town? Uh, Ursuline is the other parochial school. Yep. Daryl Clark, the quarterback at Penn State right now, is a graduate of Youngstown Ursuline. That's where our buddy Paul McGuire went. Ryan Broyles, the deep man on the punt return, getting himself in an awful lot of trouble. And can't turn the corner. It's the best play by Nebraska tonight right there. certainly is. Lost five yards on the return after a punt of 48. You can get your weekly dose of NFL news and analysis tomorrow on ESPN. Starting at 11 a.m. Eastern, Chris Berman hosts Sunday NFL Countdown presented by IBM. And at 7 Eastern, Chris and John Saunders with the highlights and scores on SportsCenter. Sunday NFL Countdown presented by IBM at 11 a.m. SportsCenter at 7 p.m. tomorrow on ESPN. Hard to catch your breath in yeah. this game. If you just joined us, it's already 28-0 Oklahoma, and literally we just started. Keep it on the ground with Chris Brown. 
They've got Murray, Brown, and Madhu, who have all had significant playing time at tailback. And as we talked about in the open, this is such a balanced offense. Yeah. I don't know anybody that's going to have a, a chance to really shut these guys down. No, I mean, you mentioned it. They've scored 35 points or more every game so far this season. And the only time they have been stopped, it's really been by their own doing. And they've taken care of the football. Only one fumble all season. I think only eight turnovers altogether. They don't give up sacks. The quarterback takes care of the football. And there are their rankings as of tonight or coming into the night. That's just a ton of yards. It 542. Is. That's only fourth in the country. Tulsa's the only team that's been scoring more. Tulsa fell out of the unbeaten ranks today with that loss against Arkansas. Nebraska. And Second Nebraska will use a timeout, a full timeout on defense. And we've got a timeout with 7.14 to go in the first quarter from Norman. Bo Pelini, about as hot as you are ever going to see a coach. And right now, he's just trying to find any button to press that works. Well, he's mad because they had to burn that timeout. And, and, and again, all he wants to see his team do is play hard and take a step forward. And they have not taken any steps forward tonight so far. Fake the end around. Shit. Bradford somehow got it in there, but it was dropped. That was a nice throw. Somebody may have gotten a fingertip on it. Adrian Tennell had it tipped by Blake Lawrence. Bradford just looks so comfortable. Yeah. He's very poised. He has great balance when he moves either left or right or in the pocket. His feet are always up underneath him. And there's uh, there's the stop that Nebraska wanted. They got a stop on third down and forced a punt and should get decent field position after this. Nate Swift, who was averaged better than 17 yards of return. There's a bobble on the snap. Somehow, Noll got it out of there. Look at this. <laughs> How about that? A 50-yard kick. Once the punter uh, fumbles the ball yeah. or bobbles it or it hits the ground, you can, you can nail him. Yeah, and somehow they did not get the ball or get him before he got it off. The ball's on the ground. He's fair game. And they just kind of oh. slowed down, it looked like, right before they got to the punter. Thomas Grove kind of hesitated instead of going right through the punter. And otherwise, they would have got great field position. But doesn't that typify what's oh, already yeah. happened That's in right. this game? Exactly. That play probably says it all. Not only do you not block it, <laughs> but he gets a 50-yard <laughs> kick at him. Right. Trying to get anything going on the ground. That'll pick up about three. Reese Davis, what do you have? Just want to look what's going on Sports Center right now. Earlier today, Florida just obliterated Georgia 49 to 10. I guess a revenge was served cold for the stop last year. And the game on ABC right now. How about the kicker pulled out of the stands? Matt Williams knocked through a field goal to go with that safety. Texas Tech on top of Texas, uh, five to nothing. Serve cold indeed, Reese. Nebraska at its 23. Lucky is the eye back. They just know where to go. Nope. And you can do just about what you want on defense as well now with a 28-point lead. Well, you, you can, can gamble. You can play recklessly. You're certainly not going to be tight. But the thing that I think that Bob Stoops and Brent Venables, defensive coordinator, want to see out of their team is sound fundamental defense. The problem, though, the last few weeks has been giving up big plays. The last three games, they've given up 20 plays, runs over 15 yards, or passes over 25 yards. And that's been the real problem, is giving up big plays. So right now, even though they got the lead, play fundamentally sound and don't give up big plays. Nebraska has gained 17 yards. Oklahoma has 28 points. There's a completion for a yep. first down out across the 35 to the 38 yard line. And Niles Paul makes the catch. Gain of 15. That's almost as many yards as they had in the previous drives 
combined. Let's go to Holly. Well, Brent Venables talked about those big plays they've given up and that he said, you know, it's just been a lack of inconsistency. When you look at this defense, he said there's just some guys who haven't been invested as long as other guys. They don't know how hard we have to play every play. And you look at it, they are very young defense. Six sophomore and freshmen on this defensive starting unit, guys. Yep. And, of course, we haven't even talked about the loss of Ryan Reynolds, their middle linebacker who was injured in the Texas game. They're still feeling the effects of that loss. And he was so important because not only was he a heck of a player, but he's the veteran presence in there that kept everybody together against Texas three weeks ago. And this looks pretty innocuous, but he's had trouble with that knee before. And he goes down. He's going to miss for the remainder of the season because of it. Uh, his third major knee injury during his time at Oklahoma. And he was the glue. He was the heart of the defense, the only linebacker with experience and kind of the signal caller for their defense. And now they're three starting linebackers. They are all in their first year of playing. Very talented, but very young. Gans on a little shovel pass, but Oklahoma ready for it. Quentin Castile takes it and immediately, after a gain of only a couple, knocked down by Travis Lewis, the redshirt freshman, who was the leading tackler on this ball club, a redshirt freshman who was a high school running yeah. back. And he just seems to get better each time he plays. I mean, last week in the game uh, against Kansas State, he had 15 tackles, two behind the line of scrimmage, and a pair of interceptions, and he returned those for 55 yards. I mean, he is a, a big-time player, but still a redshirt freshman, but very talented. Another third and long for Gans. Pressure coming. Picked it up pretty well. Pass thrown incomplete, nearly intercepted. Almost picked by Brian Jackson as the ball bounced out of Swift's hand. Jackson had a shot at it. And Nebraska will have to punt it away. This is a pretty decent throw by Joe Gans. A little bit high, but Swift usually very reliable coming on that in route, just not able to snag it. And the good news for Nebraska is the ball <laughs> fell to the ground and not into the hands of an Oklahoma defender. I was sort of amazed it wasn't pick and run back. Yeah. Titchener to kick to Broyles. Broyles going to let it go, and that one's going to die inside the five. Take a look at tonight's good hand flashback presented by Allstate 2000. October 28th here in Norman in a game coined the game of the century. The third ranked Sooners would take on number one Nebraska after falling behind 14 nothing. Josh Heupel and Oklahoma storm back 31 unanswered points on a stunned Nebraska ball club. Oklahoma would win it 31 to 14. We have seen the game of the century out here before. Yeah, Bob Stoops told us the other day that was his favorite memory that he has of this rivalry and uh, maybe even of his time here at Oklahoma. Obviously, the national championship, uh, a great memory for him, but that was his second year, and uh, people still wondering how good they were. They had won a couple big games, but all of a sudden now Nebraska was coming in highly ranked, and uh, just a great proving game for Bob Stoops and the Oklahoma Sooners. Trying to wedge out a first down, and they do up to the 14-yard line with a little more breathing room. It's kind of interesting, too, that highlight that we showed at the end when he got, before he got the Gatorade bath, the coach that gave him a hug was Mark Mangino, who is now the head coach at Kansas. And, uh, of course, a lot of guys that have coached on Bob Stoops' staff have gone on to become head coaches and have great success on their own. Murray outside. It's really remarkable the number of guys that have gone from assistants under Bob Stoops to get ho head coaching jobs. You would think Bob Stoops was about 70 right, years old exactly. with all the guys he's produced, but of course he's still a very, very young man. Uh, it's Pretty a, it's impressive a good, list. It's a very impressive list. Mike Leach, of course, at Texas Tech's got a big game tonight in Lubbock against number one Texas. And Nebraska has to use another timeout on defense. Wow. That time, apparently, they had 12 guys on the field. See, part of the problem is the no huddle and the threat of the quick counts by Oklahoma just makes it very difficult to signal defenses. And they were aware of that coming in and how difficult it is to try to change defenses against this kind of tempo. But they are having a problem. 
And you don't want to be the guy that's over there explaining to the coach why you're not on the field or why you are. Holly Rowe? Well, guys, the reason that he's playing right now, Colton Kohler's the guy that was kind of in trouble on that number 54, came running off, had a blown assignment on that. But he's in there playing for Philip Diller, who's out in or injured. Now, keep in mind, Colton Kohler, he's just a junior. He hasn't played that much. He's a walk-on, so he's got a big responsibility tonight trying to fill in in that middle linebacker position. People are so impatient, Holly, and you've got to give Bo Pelini and his coaching staff a chance. This was one of the worst defensive units on the face of the planet a year yeah. ago. You can't turn it around overnight no matter how good a coach you are. But you look at Bo Pelini's history as a defensive coach, he will turn it around. Well, it, it's got to start with recruiting. I mean, he's got to get the kind of personnel that he wants and needs to do the things that he wants to do scheme-wise. And that takes time. Bradford, a little bubble screen that's only going to get a couple. Of course, he had his major success at LSU as part of a national championship down there. In 2007, they were third, also 2006, 2005. And that's being third in a conference yeah. that's loaded with talent. So that should be third with a bullet. Well, a conference that plays great defense. I mean, the Big 12 is known for their offense. The SEC known for their defense. And uh, very, very impressive. And that year that he was here at Nebraska, or where he was in Nebraska in 03, a lot of credibility with even some of the guys, the fifth-year guys on this team this year when he came back. Bradford, even when there is pressure on him, just looks so cool and comfortable. That yeah. time he was throwing to Tunnell again. You know, everybody kind of, there were some people who were saying, well, he kind of fell off the, the Heisman thing last week because he completed under 50% of his passes. I mean, he threw three touchdowns. They scored 55 points in the first half. They didn't have to throw in the second half. I mean, he's special. The standards have become a little ridiculous, haven't they, yeah. when you're going to criticize a kid for that? Only a sophomore from Oklahoma City. His father, Kent, played here, a citizen of the Cher Cherokee tribe. Hopes to become a corporate attorney. I think he may have to wait yeah. on that for a while. Yeah. It was funny. I was talking to Bob Stoops before the game about when they first saw Sam Bradford, and he really credited Chuck Long, who was the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator uh, here before Kevin Wilson. Quarterback draw. All the room in the world to run slides in safely at the 42. But they had Sam Bradford here at their camp for a couple of years, and he got a chance to watch him and work with him and talk to him. And, you know, when you have a kid in camp, you also get to a feel for their personality. And Chuck Long went to Bob Soups and said, I, I really like this guy. I mean, this is the guy I think we can really go with. And obviously it, it has worked out tremendously because he is uh, he's special. He can really throw the football. Only get a couple on this carry to uh, Murray. I think Sue, Sue was, yeah, I think he was, was offside. offside. Yep. Tried to anticipate the snap count and uh, got into neutral zone a little too soon. And Damaken Sue, 300 pounder out of Portland, Oregon, brings to mind the Johnny Cash song. <laughs> I know that song. My daddy left town when I was three. He didn't leave much for mom. Me. <laughs> I know that song. Yes, sir. <laughs> First and five for Oklahoma. Fans aren't even cheering. I mean, we're at Oklahoma to sell out crowd. And they're just sitting on their hands. They're already up 28 nothing. Another perfect strike. Quentin Chaney makes the catch. It shows you the depth and the skill positions for Oklahoma. Quentin Chaney's a senior, but he was not a starter. And then Manuel Johnson hyperextended his elbow two weeks ago at Can to get the Kansas game. And Chaney stepped in and has played beautifully since then. So now they've got even more depth. And now they've got there goes maybe Brown. another touchdown. To the goal line. This call will occur. The one. The balance, the, the balance that Oklahoma yep. has in the offense is the best that I've seen. I mean, I, I've seen Alabama, they can run the football. 
Their good play action pass, Penn State with their spread offense is, a, is an exciting offense. I think this offensive line and their ability to run the football and then Sam Bradford and all the skill guys they have makes them the best, most potent offense in college football. Balance is incredible. Little swing pass. Chris Brown, that was too easy. You're ready, and fellas. You're right. Time to the go ponies. again. Whoa. Four nothing. There's still four ticks on the clock here in the first quarter. Jeez. <laughs> Thirty-five zip. I'm gonna think this thing is a marathon by the time they're done today. The scooter takes the field again. I mean, these new shoes by the fourth quarter. Well, we were wondering what the record was. There it is, 42 points in the first quarter. I don't think they're going to catch that unless uh, Nebraska mishandles <laughs> this kickoff. Now that would test the friendship, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah. Boy, and Bo Pelini, you could light a cigar on his forehead right now. Well, the thing is, is Bo Pelini is a competitor, and he's a fighter. And, and right now, I don't think he's seeing that in his football team. I think he's seeing his football team yeah. that doesn't want to fight anymore, and he's not going to allow that. I mean, they've got three quarters of football, and I know he doesn't care what the scoreboard says anymore. He just wants to see his team show some heart. Boy, it's just not anything going to go well for this team. Uh, they're going to give him a touchback. That was awfully close to being a safety. Yeah. Holy cow. Well, that would have capped it off in the first quarter, wouldn't it? Unbelievable. Coming up, Taste of the Town storms into Norman. Todd gets barbecue for all age groups in 90 seconds. Find out what's going on. Welcome back to Norman. If you're shocked, so are we. 35 nothing end of the quarter. Now time for Todd's Taste of the Town, brought to you by Chase. This is the first game I've ever worked in Norman, Oklahoma, and it didn't take me very long to find a great spot for barbecue that has one of the greatest names I've ever heard in a restaurant, Vans Pig Stand. Now, the original Vans was opened in 1930 in Shawnee, Oklahoma, by a guy named Leroy Van Vandergriff. The business is still family owned, and there are currently five locations, including the one here in Norman that opened in 1994. Now what you eat here at Vans kind of depends on your age bracket. If you're over 60, you're probably going to get the Vans traditional trademark pig sandwich, a pulled pork sandwich with a special homemade relish on the bottom bun. The younger said they're going to move more towards the slow smoked brisket or ribs. I want to be a candidate for all the people, so I got it all. Hmm. I've got my vote. Well, of course you got it all. You always get it all. <laughs> well, you know what? I actually couldn't eat it all. I, I, I ate most of it. Listen, I had to share a little bit with Bo Garrett, our producer. The, the I got a sandwich. call. We're very concerned about you. <laughs> and uh, okay, cough. I can't hear a thing. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, shoot. It's amazing. You're going to wake up. You're going to be 450 one morning. <laughs> Gans play action fake. Hit as he throws. That's going to be complete, but for a loss of about two yards. You know, one thing that's just uh, one final comment about Vans pig stand. It, Mark and Nina Schumann are the, the owners and operators now, and Nina is part of the Vandergriff family. And the restaurant here in Norman actually opened, ironically, in 1994, the day of an Oklahoma-Nebraska game. It was November 25th, and that year, 
Nebraska won the game 13 to 3. So uh, they opened uh, in the morning, and uh, by 6 o'clock that <laughs> night, they had run completely out of food. Didn't run out when I was here yesterday, though. Sorry, correction on that last play. It's second and two, and very close to a first down here. The reason I had the uh, stethoscope out is because it's, uh, just look at the menu. I mean, there's fried, cut. well, it's fried. That, Shrimp had that, grits with it. I had salmon, though. Salmon? salmon? Yes, you did. Week. Congratulations. Yeah, your cholesterol's got to be under 250 <laughs> by now. For more, log on to ESPN.com, and you can get all the restaurants and... Steps up, throws on the run. What a good throw and nearly a catch on the tip. Nick Harris was there. Let's go back to the studio. All right, Mike. Little Sports Center in game. We'll check up Texas, Texas Tech. Taco Bell studio update. Baron Batch going in on the running play for Texas Tech. That capped off a drive a little bit longer than 95 yards. 12 nothing Red Raiders over number one Texas. How about that? Boy, that would shake things up, wouldn't it? I tell you what, that Texas Tech team's for real. I watched them on tape against Nebraska, and their offense is, uh, they're pretty special as well. Well, we'll get into this. If Should they win this ball game over number one Texas? And I mean, Texas has gone through, gone yeah. through the mill with their right. schedule. If Texas Tech should win this game, how far would they move up? How many people would they jump? with a win over number one. Interesting. Well, obviously, uh, I would think they would move all the way up to at least five, maybe yeah. even, you know, a shade higher. And this Nebraska team took Texas Tech to overtime. This league is so good, especially the South. Just, it, it's really unfair that the four teams in the South this year are in there together. This one is to Swift. Swift down the sideline, inside the five. Nate Swift, who passed Johnny Rogers a week ago as the number one all-time receiver in this school's history, picks up 67 yards. And here's one of those big plays that the Oklahoma defense was trying to avoid. Swift gets behind the corner, and it's just a poor angle by the safety. Nick Harris, number five, coming over to help over the top. Took a bad angle to the football. And Gans hit Swift in stride, and then Swift made the rest of it with one, making one guy miss. But the big plays have really hurt the Oklahoma defense. With a pretty throw to Castile, dives to the one. Nate Swift is an interesting guy. I really enjoyed visiting with him last night at their hotel, and he's a he's a receiver who. A lot of times the coaches say, you know, teams underestimate him. They don't think he's a real skilled guy. They look at him, they think just a pure possession guy, but he's a very skilled receiver, and that's why he's had such a big year this year. Castile, nothing. Lendy Holmes on the tackle. Gans looks toward the sideline for the play. Third down. I wouldn't be surprised to see Gans with something on the outside, a little run pass option. He's a mobile guy. He hasn't run the ball yet tonight, but has the ability to get outside and make a play with his legs as well as his arms. Well, you've got to assume they're going to have two shots at it, down 28-0. Castillo again, touchdown. Nice play. Sue, the big... Defensive lineman, the 300-pounder, was the up back to add additional blocking. Nice block by Drew Young, number 49, the motion tight end also. And a nice block at the point of attack. And that's exactly what Bo Pelini wanted to see. Want to see a little spark for his yeah. ball club, and that good throw from Gans to Swift was it. You just don't want to see your team lay down. I mean, you want to see them fight. And, and not watch the scoreboard, but fight one play at a time and have something to build on. And, and this drive, 
was something that Bo Pelini and the, and the Cornhusker staff can build on. Welcome back to Oklahoma. Let's take a look at tonight's Aflac. trivia question from 1946 to 1995. Nebraska and Oklahoma won or shared the Big 8 Conference title 46 times over a 50 year span. What two schools won the other four titles outright? This is not easy. Not easy. He's pretty amazing when you think about it. 46 That's times. Staggering. Years. What they used to call it, Big Two Little Six. Yeah, and the Orange Bowl was the winner home for one oh, of these two yeah, teams. You know? and that was Murray and Iglesias are deep for the Nebraska kick. Iglesias from the one. Has a seam. Across the 40 to the 42 yard line. The history of these two schools is simply remarkable in the sphere of college football. 12 national titles between them, 84 conference titles between them, and seven Heisman winners. Yep. Uh, it's just staggering. Numbers. It really is. Had a penalty on the kickoff return as well. During the return, personal foul, face mask, kicking team number 82, 15 yard penalty, first down. T.J. O'Leary called for the penalty. Well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the the big two and little six, and, and the change in the dynamics as we take a look at the end of this play again. There's the face mask at the very end. But the change in the dynamics of the conference and the improvement of teams like Missouri and Kansas and Kansas State over the last several years has changed the, the recruiting for Nebraska. It's a much difficult, yes. more difficult for them to recruit now than it, it used to be when really they were only competing with Oklahoma in terms of recruits in Texas. Iglesias, nice little spin move to pick up an extra yard on the short out from Bradford. And of course, those those were also the days where you could have 175, yeah. 200 players, and they did with the walk-on programs, right. especially in Nebraska. And you just go through those guys till you found a few that could play, and it really worked for them. Bradford with a pump fake, and then wants to go deep, just past the outstretch hands of Quentin Cheney. Matt O'Hanlon had the coverage. You got to make that play. And take a look at Nebraska. During that stretch, 1970 to 1999, five national titles, 17 conference championships. And since then, a uh, couple of goose eggs there. But I, I do think Bo Pelini is a good hire, the right guy for that job at the right time. And I think he will get it done, but it's not going to happen overnight. And recruiting is really where it all starts. Blitz coming, perfect call against its screen. There was a hold, no flag down. The Nebraska sideline was going nuts. Gain of 16 on the screen. Somebody got away with a big time hold on the screen. Now, it was a good call though. There's the pressure. If, if it's a blitz, there's the, the hold right there. Yeah. Number 74 coming out in front of the play, Brian Simmons. Usually you don't get away with that in front of the other team's bench. Well, especially when the jersey comes yeah. out. I mean, that was an easy call. Gresham makes this catch. Matt Clapp, and you can just tell the coaches on the sideline are saying, hey, wait a minute. Things are going bad enough. You don't have to miss something like that. Quickly, right back to action, and they're really mixing up the tempo. Moses Madu getting his chance. Young man, a sophomore from right here in Norman, Oklahoma. When Kevin Wilson, when they signal the plays in, and, and he says as soon as the tackle is made, he's calling the next play. Now there's a Nebraska player down right now, so we'll have a stop in the action, but their whole tempo thing, as soon as the tackle is made, he's calling the next play and starting to signal it into the skill guys. And part of the signal package determines whether we're going to go up there and go fast or whether we're going to slow down and take another look over and change the play. 
but there's always that threat that they're going to line up and go right now. And so what that does is it forces a defense yeah. to play more vanilla. You just you have to kind of show your hand because you have to get ready to play in case they do snap it quickly. Injured player Anthony West a little slow to get up. Sophomore defensive back. So you might say then, well, if it's so effective doing that and playing with that kind of tempo, why doesn't everybody do it? Well, partly because uh, you got to have the right quarterback to, to handle it and to run it. And you got to execute and be efficient because if you go fast and go three and out, it doesn't do you any good. Yeah. And it helps to have some smart players on the outside so that everybody's on the same page when they're looking over and know exactly what the play call is. There's a lot of teams that go no huddle and a lot of teams in this league. They go no huddle. But not everybody plays as fast a tempo as Oklahoma. Bradford standing in the pocket forever. Excellent coverage that time. The pass was intended for Tanell, and Prince Amu Kamara had the coverage and did it very well. Let's go to Holly. Well, guys, Sam Bradford, one of his great qualities is how humble and quiet he is. More after this play, guys. Looks like they're going to go quick. Oh, maybe not. Anyway, you know, before the game, I was really surprised. The last thing he did before he left the field in pregame warmups was grab his wide receivers, get in their face, and really high tempo yelling, hey, guys, let's go out and put some numbers up tonight. Grand like him. Boy, they put him up, too. Yeah, they must have listened. And they're really going away from their strength of the wide receivers. Tanell will make that catch. He and Chaney have been very active. Usually, it's Johnson, Broyles, Iglesias, and Greshman. They've sort of been complimentary tonight. Yeah. Well, that makes them even more difficult to defend because they can yeah. put five guys out there, and you really can't guess where they're going to throw the football because he's spreading it all over the place. Now they've got Murray in a slot and Stein cooler. Jumps off sides, and if that is a familiar Get name to foul. you, Offside. it should be because his dad, Dean, was one of the uh, great players in the history, yep. not only of Nebraska, but college football. He was yep. just an unbelievable college player. And one of the things that, and I said this the last time we had Oklahoma earlier in the year against Washington, I, I think the key to this offense is, is number one, Sam Bradford, and number two is their offensive line. Now, this is really a good offensive line. 150 career starts combined coming into the game tonight. A couple All-American candidates up there, the left guard, Duke Robinson, an All-American. Quarterback draw. Not this time. Didn't have a chance because Sue got him around the shoulders and dragged him down short of the first down. You got four seniors and one junior. The only junior is the right tackle, Trent Williams. Fourth and a yard, and they're going to go for it. Yeah. You got that kind of offensive line. Why not? Murray's back in there. Now, do you agree with this call, or would you go for a field goal? No, I, I would probably go for it right here. Well, when it's that easy, why not? DeMarco Murray just walks yeah. into the end zone. Nebraska guessing inside run. They stun it to the inside. And Murray very smartly bounced it outside. I think the play was designed to go inside. But he saw that hole close up, bounced it out, and there was no contain with the Nebraska defense. Cody Glenn, the outside linebacker, their leading tackler, was the guy who tried to fill the hole inside. But you can't, you can't stop everything, especially with a team that does things this well. And right now, Nebraska being steamrolled. 42 to 7. Number four, Oklahoma, rolling at home. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Taco Bell, Think Outside the Bug, and Aflac, Ask About It at Work. It's loud. They're happy. He isn't. Big night so far if you're a Sooner fan. 
The margin of victory, the biggest in the history of this rivalry, Nebraska won by 62 back in 97. Oklahoma's big margin was 48. That was back in 1949. Got a leg up on that one. They're already up by 35 here. We have 8.06 to go in the half. Niles Paul from the three. And got it out to the 20. Let's check in with Reese Davis. Reese. Hi, going to let you know what's going on in the family of networks. Texas Tech up on Texas, 19 to nothing. Remember the last time the Longhorns went to Lubbock, they fell behind 21 to nothing, came back to win. They only had the ball a little over four minutes. A couple of drops, very uncharacteristic so far for Colt McCoy and the Longhorn offense. South Carolina continues to roll on ESPN2 against Tennessee. It's 24 to nothing halfway through the third. Mm. Boy, it's got to be getting a little nasty in Knoxville. Roy Hello Jr. is into the ball game as the eye back. Fake it to him. Gans wants to throw under pressure. Dumps it to Hello. And he'll get about four. Mention the Big 12 South before and how loaded it is. Texas, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma. Well, in, in Oklahoma, obviously not paying attention to the Texas-Texas Tech game right now, but, but pulling for the Red Raiders. But Oklahoma still has Texas Tech. November 22nd here, and then Oklahoma State in Stillwater at the end of the year, November 29th. So a couple of huge ball games left in the Big 12 South for Oklahoma. Gans wants a screen, got it out to Hello. Hurdles a man out to the 40-yard line. A gain of 15 yards. See, the Nebraska offense looks like they're starting to get their feet on the ground a little bit, but it, they're just, they got blown out so quick early between their own mistakes and turnovers and their defense and their kicking yeah. game that they're in a huge hole. But, but this is what I expected to see from the Nebraska offense. I thought they'd move the football in Oklahoma and be able to score some points. I mean, they, they're a good-looking offense that for the last three weeks has been very efficient. But they started out the game not taking care of the football and got themselves in a huge hole. Empty backfield for Gans. Short set throws underneath will pick up maybe about five yards to Todd Peterson. Peterson and Swift just have been tremendous receivers as under Bill Callahan they uh, went with the West Coast offense guys were racking up big numbers. Now they're going to go back and change the culture a little bit. It was changed really from a culture that didn't need change. Yeah. Well they got away from uh, the eye formation and option football and what they had really hung their hat on for so long and made a dramatic departure from that. Heller on the outside. Nice cutback. This kid is obviously very athletic, as you saw from that earlier hurdle. This one for 25 yards. He's out of Danville, California, a sophomore who averaged nearly six yards a carry coming in. Nice job. Little counter action in the backfield. And then just the speed. A bad angle to the football that time by Quentin Carter, the safety, number 20. And he was able to bounce it out. Carter was unblocked. And they're really, Oklahoma, very high on Quentin Carter. He's played very well the last couple of weeks, but that time came up to make a big hit and took a bad angle to the football. Gans. See, that's what I like about Gans, is, is his ability to extend the play. And what that means is when the protection starts to break down a little bit, he has the ability to move outside the pocket but keep his vision down the field and make a play. I mean, there, a lot of quarterbacks can make plays when everything's right, but the special ones are the ones who can make plays when, when things break down. At last completion to Todd Peterson. The former walk-on, and they have advanced to the Oklahoma 21-yard line. Gans running again, and hangs on. This time will pick up about eight. Gans waited his turn 
didn't get to start until three games left last year out of Palos Heights, Illinois. Saw Tommy Frazier on television and really liked him. Said there was no, he didn't like Notre Dame or Michigan, so there was nobody to root for. Yeah. When you grew up in Chicago, he was an all-state baseball player and has set all kind of records at Nebraska as far as throwing the football his last three games over 300 yards nearly 75 percent completions but this game was a disaster for him at the very beginning now they're trying to come back from it Roy Hello Jr. busts through and gets the touchdown a nice read this time the Oklahoma defense was really overloaded to the opposite side and they really fooled him they surprised the Oklahoma defense Oklahoma thinking pass they came with a little zone read back to the backside and an easy touchdown for the Cornhuskers. And as you saw, Bob Stoops turned to be a little irritated. Nice series for Roy Hello Jr. Yeah. Had three big plays on that drive that went 80 yards, three minutes and 42 seconds, seven plays. And Nebraska has 14 points in the first half, but still trail big time, 42-14. Takes the ball at the 30. He's hit and got away. He's to the 45. He's to the 50, to the 45, to the 20, to the 10. He's all the way home. Mildren busting one out here to a man who's open. It's a touchdown, Oklahoma lead. He got away from Jacobson. Then the ball knocked down by Glover. And Jacobson's on it in the end zone. <laughs> That 1971 meeting known as the game of the century, what a great game it was. Two undefeated teams. Oklahoma wins at 35-31. They're going to honor players and coaches from both teams yeah. from that game. Here's the great Tom Osborne, who I had the chance to uh, speak with a little earlier tonight. Barry Switzer. team is uh, headed in the right direction. Barry Switzer got up, uh, put up a lot of those wins. Murray. Seen straight up the middle. DeMarco Murray. And now the answer to tonight's Aflac trivia question from 1946 to 95. Nebraska and Oklahoma won or shared the Big 8 conference title 46 times over a 50-year span. What two schools won the other titles outright? Did you get this right no. this morning? Well, no, I did not. Missouri, 1960, and Colorado in 61, 89, and 90. Nobody else. Nobody. No. It's not that way anymore. I think I knew the two Colorado, the two last Colorados. I didn't know the other two, though. Oklahoma sets up offense at the 43-yard line. Bradford to Iglesias. Little bubble screen. Got a block and out of bounds at the 38. You know what's kind of interesting about that? Reunion the, the, and the game of the century, and them having it here is that Nebraska won the game, right? Yes, and and they're having it here. They're, that's kind of a pretty neat gesture on the it part is. of Oklahoma to uh, to honor Tom Osborne and the Nebraska guys that way. Of course, Osborne was an assistant on that staff, went on to uh, a great career as the head coach, now the athletic director. Joe Castiglione, the Oklahoma athletic director, uh, came up to say hello earlier. And he just wants this program to get better and better. They got together last night, taking a look at some of the memorabilia. Forty teammates of Oklahoma's team shared memories with 20 players from the Huskers. Barry Switzer, Johnny Rogers. And it's nice to see some yeah. of those familiar faces and some of the great names in college football. Oklahoma on the ground with Chris Brown inside the 15 to the 10 to the 7. Gain of 29. Chris Brown has had quite an evening already here in the first half. Well, again, that offensive line kind of sets the table for everything that Oklahoma does. It sets the table for their running game. It sets the table for Sam Bradford, the pass protection, and him throwing the football around. Really an outstanding group up front. 
Murray comes back in as Brown will get a breather. 76 first half yards on the ground for Brown and the touchdown. Murray cuts it back inside. Touchdown. Mm. Well, this is what Nebraska saw last year from too many teams. People running up huge numbers against them. For the second time, DeMarco Murray sees some daylight outside, bounces it outside. Not a very good job of contained by the Nebraska defense. Ryan Broyles, the wide receiver, with a pretty good block out there from the slot. And another easy touchdown, fast for Oklahoma. You had better get a good start against Oklahoma. In the last two weeks, with this extra point, they will have scored 104 points in the last two weeks in the first half. In the first half. So you either get started early or forget it. Tonight, forget it. On the eve of this year's presidential election, two of the NFL's elite will face off in the nation's capital. Tune in and vote for Ben Roethlisberger and the 5-2 Steelers or Clinton Portis and the 6-2 Redskins. And don't miss halftime when Chris Berman will be joined by Barack Obama and John McClain. John McClain. John McCain. I'm sorry, Senator. In one of your last chances to hear the candidates before you go to the polls on Tuesday, I'm sure Chris has been working on nicknames. Niles Paul is deep. From the one. Shakes off a tackle, gets out of bounds at the 20. Everything was uh, really hunky dory before yeah. the game, wasn't it? It sure was. The Youngstown connection, Bob Stoops, all the friends, the laughs. Team charge come out of the hat. And then uh, it, <laughs> it got bad quickly for Nebraska and for Bo Pelini. And uh, a competitor, a fighter, and uh, wanted his team to take a step forward tonight. And now, he's just not yelling at Bob Stoops. Uh, I think he's part of those is yelling at his brother, who's a defensive <laughs> coordinator. And anyone else who's on the same frequency as he is. Yeah, I think you're waiting for hoping your headset fails yeah. over there now. there Nebraska trying to get something going with Hello again, and he's knocked down by Jeremy Beal. The defensive end. Let's go to Holly. Well, guys, funny you would mention that, but earlier in this half, the Nebraska coaching headsets did fail. It's just one of those nights for them. If anything can go wrong, it has gone wrong. There were some technicians over there behind the bench frantically working to get the sound, get the system back up and working, but even that has been on the fritz tonight. Holly, I think the assistant coaches were hoping that uh, they couldn't fix them. Would have been merciful. Blitz coming. Gans. Flanker screen. Swift. Check it, Todd Peterson instead of Swift. Let's go to Reese. All right, Mike, coming up on the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. Holly was just talking about everything going wrong for Nebraska. Pretty much the same deal at the moment for Texas. Down 19-3 to Texas Tech. Red Raiders back in the red zone. Florida and Georgia was a complete beatdown. We'll talk about the best one-loss team in college football and a hit Notre Dame thriller. They got Mark and Lou's entrance, guys. All right, Reese, this is if Texas loses to Texas Tech, it is going to be fascinating what is going to happen in the poll. Gans trying to get outside, tackled inbounds at the 38-yard line. Jackson makes the stop because you'll have Texas Tech moving up. Yeah. Oklahoma obviously with a big win here. USC is winning big against Washington. Right. Uh, but that's going to carry a lot of weight. And Penn State is off. Right. And that could work to their disadvantage. And Alabama played a, a team that they should have beaten bad in Arkansas State, yeah. but they still played and won. And, uh, yeah, it's going to get interesting, but uh, certainly Texas Tech and Oklahoma making a pretty big statement here tonight. Roy Hello Jr. up to the 47. And, of course, remember last November. Yeah. I mean, what didn't happen last November? One stunning upset after another that really changed the face of the way we look at college football. Clock running. I remember Nebraska with no timeouts. They had to use their timeouts yep. defensively in that first half, so really hurting them here right at the end of the half. One of the things that made Bull Pointy even matter 
This one down the middle intended for McNeil is tight end who caught 18 balls coming in. Austin Fox, the young linebacker with the coverage. Of course, last November, it was about as stunning as, as you could possibly imagine. Number one went two and three. Number two went one and four. And five of those seven losses were to teams that weren't even in the top 25. Four of the losses came at home. And just when you thought, well, you can't possibly have it anymore, it did. Clock stopped, 40 seconds to go. Pressure coming, Gans in trouble. Somehow got out of it. Throws on a run. Is still, they'd have been better off, actually, if that one was incomplete. It was such a short game to McNeil. And the clock is running. That cost him about 13 seconds to complete a pass that does, does them no good. Pressure coming on Gans. Throws underneath. Incomplete. Intended that one for Hello. Jeremy Beal was putting the pressure on. And 11 seconds to go in the half. Well, they say this is the time at football games where they sell the most stuff at the concession stand. That people, especially if, if it's at home and you have a huge lead, people just pig out like you wouldn't <laughs> believe at halftime they go to the concession stand. It's sort of like Todd's taste of the town. Yeah. Instead of getting one thing, they sample what you did. I'll have all three and just enjoy them. That's what they do at a football game. Well, I wonder if they'll make a mad dash for the concession stand tonight or if they'll stay and watch the uh, the guys from that 71 game being honored. That's got to be a special treat for, uh, oh, for the absolutely. fans here as well. And they will kick it away. Alonzo Dennard. You know, the thing I remember, too, I don't remember the 71 game other than watching highlights, but the, that game had such a niche, too, being played right around Thanksgiving. Oh, you know, it just was a, a game that was a regional game that had national appeal, I think, because of the programs and growing up in Ohio, I can remember enjoying watching Oklahoma and Nebraska play. Dominique Franks was back, and then he, uh, he sneaks up. Yeah, it was a game that everybody watched every year. Yep. I mean, it was guaranteed. There was uh, some enormous number, like 55 million people that watched that game back in 1971. Tomorrow afternoon, is it a formality yet? On ABC, points leader Jimmy Johnson closes in on his third straight cup title. Carl Edwards and the rest of the chase field trying to hold him back. And really, if Jimmy Johnson just stays out of trouble, he's in. We're staying out of trouble in NASCAR is a little easier said than done. <laughs> Even if you don't want to swap paint, some other guys do. Yep. And they'll down it and finish the first half. Oklahoma overwhelming Nebraska here in Norman. The halftime score, Oklahoma 49, Nebraska 14. Let's go to Reese Davis and the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. to ESPN College Football Prime Time presented by Hampton Hotels. Here are the first half stats. Surprisingly close, 305 to 224. Three turnovers, however, that led to 21 Oklahoma points. Well, those three turnovers occurred in Nebraska's first five possessions, yeah. too. I mean, so, I mean, the game was was really out of reach very, very early on, and they settled down and, and moved the football in the first half in the second quarter, but boy, they were in a huge hole. Yeah, it got ugly early. 
Nebraska gets the ball first to start the second half. Niles Paul from the two. Trying to turn the corner, almost did. Takes it out to the 17 yard line. We talked about it, it, it tough to evaluate a game like this, of course, because of the turnovers. Yeah. But we talked about how good Oklahoma is. We had had the good fortune to see them earlier this year at Washington. And this really is good football. Well, particularly offensively. Offensively, they're as good as I've seen. I mean, they've got great balance. They can run. They can throw. They've got a quarterback who makes great decisions. Yeah. Defensively, they're athletic and they can run. But they still have a, a tendency to give up some plays. And I think that's the biggest area of improvement for them because as you look at their schedule, uh, they've got some good offensive football teams that they've got to play yet in Texas Tech and Oklahoma State. So defensively is where they really need to step up. Roy Hellu Jr., who made a statement in the first half, making another one as he gets down near the Oklahoma 40-yard line. The young man out of Danville, California, getting a lot of work. Nice job by Hellu. He just found the hole. I mean, the linebacker came through Travis Lewis came through the outside gap he saw that and stepped inside and found a little crease and then got to the outside a nice read by Hellu on the run he just froze the safety Lundy Holmes and went around it yep. that'll make the Nebraska coaching staff feel a little bit better Gans under pressure throws on the run incomplete intended for Swift good coverage by Brian Jackson here's Holly well, checking it with both coaches at halftime, how they manage a game when it's so out of balance like this. First of all, Bob Stoops says it doesn't matter. We play just the same. It doesn't matter what the score says. He's looking for execution from his team. He said particularly on defense, we have to be better on defense. Now, for Bo Pelini, I asked him what the tone was in the locker room. He said, you know, I had to just be matter of fact. We got beaten all three phases. Screaming and yelling was not going to help these guys at that point. He said, I was proud that they had some fight in them, came back and scored twice. But bottom line, we have to play like it's 0 Zero. And Holly, that was very interesting because exactly that's what Todd speculated earlier in the ball game that he, Bo Pelini, did not want to see his guys give up. Right. He wanted to see that fight, and he did see it. Yeah, I think he did, and, and I think it's interesting what Holly just said it is with Bo Pelini in Nebraska, his team has to play like it's zero zero. Don't worry about. It. Let's just try to win the third quarter right now, and then if we do that, let's try to win the fourth quarter. And Nebraska, you know, you can't really say play like a 0-0 zero, because zero, they know they've got a big lead. Sure. But you want to see them stay focused and execute and make plays and not let down on your intensity. Peterson, the man in motion. Pressure coming. Gans gets rid of it, and Peterson hangs on. 20, 10, 5. It's a nice job by Peterson hanging on. Keaton, Keenan Clayton tried to punch the ball out instead of tackling the receiver. It was man coverage. Oklahoma came with a blitz. And watch Keenan Clayton, number 22, try to punch the football out instead of tackling the receiver. And by missing that, he actually allowed Peterson to add about 12, 15 yards yes, to sir. the reception. You know, it, it, I always get a kick out of coaches trying to say, well, let's play it like it's nothing, nothing. Yeah. If you could convince a locker room full of kids that it was nothing, yeah. nothing, those are guys you wouldn't have recruited in the first place. <laughs> or they would have been able to get in academically. That's right. <laughs> Roy Hello Jr. trying to get to the outside. Nothing there, and he's driven out of bounds back at the 10. Good tackle by Lendy Holmes coming up from the safety spot. Nice job by Travis Lewis. He was the guy who really forced that to bounce outside. Looks like he's hurt yeah, a little he bit. Is. He the grabbed, that play. grabbed his side, Todd, when that play was over. He's really some story. Redshirt freshman from San Antonio, Texas. Still working on defensive fundamentals. He was recruited as a running back. That's what he was in high school. And he's just learning the concept of playing defense. He certainly has the athletic ability. Gans. That play looked doomed yeah. from the beginning. He can move, but he's not exactly the option guy you're looking for. We mentioned Travis Lewis out of San Antonio. Got that speed, 4-3-4. Four, four. And look at the bench press for a guy who was a running back. He originally committed to Nebraska and then was a late choice and went to Oklahoma. 
And all he's done this year as a linebacker is lead the team in tackles. 84 tackles yeah. coming into the night. Three and a half sacks. And he also leads the team with three interceptions. So uh, he has done it all. Gans trying to roll away from trouble. Throws in the end zone. Touchdown. Swift was open by a couple of steps and Gans with the perfect strike and Nebraska gets its third touchdown. And you see the ability of Joe Gans being able to move in the pocket and throw on the run under duress. Change the launching point for the football, a different view for the quarterback and he finds his favorite receiver Swift in the corner for a touch. Swift a good receiver and you're right about Gans. The kid's got some skill. Yeah, he does. And NFL scouts have been at practice and they are impressed with what he does, even though he doesn't have very much experience in the NFL really needs quarterbacks. When we come back, Polly and a visit with Barry Switzer and Tom Osborne. Very nice scene before the ball game as the university honored both members of the Nebraska and Oklahoma football teams and coaching staff from the 1971 game of the century. It was the first game of the century. There have been several since then, but it uh, lived up to its billing. Yeah, that highlight of Johnny Rogers punt return is kind of one of the most lasting memories in college sure football is. one of the most replayed plays you've ever seen but you made a great point this morning when we showed it in our production meeting most people they have the feeling that won the game that started the game that was the first points of the game that's right Iglesias and it's a 34 Holly had a chance to catch up to two very memorable stars of those programs. Well, these were two offensive coordinators for that game of the century. Coach, what do you remember the most about that big game? Well, I remember losing. That's the first thing I remember about it. Uh, we played, there was two great teams all year long on a collision course and at uh, aim on Thanksgiving Day. Anyone in America knew that there was two best teams played that day and that was a national championship game play. I guess people think of this OU Nebraska rivalry, but Coach, I was really impressed when the fans here tonight gave you a standing ovation when you were introduced. How do you feel about the respect between this rivalry? Well, we've always had a great relationship uh, between the people in Nebraska and Oklahoma. Uh, sometimes you think of a rivalry as being uh, nasty and vindictive. Barry was never that way, I was never that way, and our fans were never that way, and the players always got along. So. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great tradition and probably a rivalry in the, in the very best sense of the word. All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Hawk. Holly, Tom Osborne, uh, one of the finest gentlemen it's ever been my pleasure to know in this business. Uh, uh, it just exudes class. I tell you, Barry Switzer, he kind of cracks me up. I did a show uh, in the ESPN studio a couple years ago uh -huh. after the season, and it was a uh, it was a show where we were projecting like the if the 71 Nebraska team played the 94 Penn State team is one of those kind of shows uh -huh. and the people that called in and voted well there were some players that were on the you know and announcers that were on the uh, the, the group there and then some coaches and Barry Switzer was one of the guys on there boy he got fired up I mean he <laughs> he he was getting fired up about some of his Oklahoma teams. Well, he was always fired up. Yeah. This one's complete to Gresham. Flags it down. That'll be a late hit. This guy is, uh, he is a unique talent now, Gresham. I mean, you, you think about it, he's a tight end. He's 6'6", 261. He's a junior. And he can run. And he can run. And he's got big, strong hands. He's a very difficult guy to match up Ball with. Foul, personal foul, late hit on the defense, number three. Half the distance to the goal, first down. When you have a guy like this, he's too big for a safety, and he's usually too fast for a linebacker. And that time, nobody covered him. I mean, he just found oh. a hole in the defense. A Ricky Tenars just comes over and makes a really stupid play. Yeah. So it's a first down at the just inside the 15 yard line. Chris Brown, the tailback. A lot of room to run on the right side. And Brown taken down just outside the 10. Good block by John Cooper. Good tackle by Colton Kohler. Yeah. 
the junior walk-on who is uh, playing in the middle for the injured Philip Dillard. Talked about how athletic this offensive line is for Oklahoma. That play was the center pulling. John Cooper is the starting center. He was the guy pulling out and leading that play. One more touchdown and a high watermark for Oklahoma against Nebraska. Bradford wide open. Touchdown, Gresham. Boy, when they have scored, they have made it look so, so easy. Well, Sam Bradford, I know he's got a little bit of grass stain on the back of his pants, but not much. And I don't know, he made a trip coming out of the locker room at halftime and got that because I haven't seen him get knocked down. 15 of 19, 197 yards, three touchdowns. But the protection is just outstanding. And uh, he has been able to just see what he wants to see and put the ball where he wants to put it. You can never go back, but it would have been interesting to see what would have happened in this ball game had the fates not dictated what this game was going to be. Uh, the early mistakes by Nebraska that just doomed them in the shootout with Oklahoma. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Chase Freedom. Introducing rewards points you can use like cash. Visit chase.com slash freedom. And the phenomenal four from Mitsubishi. Four cars, four cylinders, zero compromises. Oh. Always fun. Trying to get 30, oh. 40,000 calories in one bag. Let's see, it's been a treat for Oklahoma, it's been a trick for Nebraska. But you made a good point, those early mistakes for Nebraska, I thought the only chance they had was to win a shootout. They can score and they can move the football, but they can't spot a team like Oklahoma the way they did. No. Niles Paul stays on his feet until about the 28-yard line. And you can't give anything easy to a quarterback like Sam Bradford. I mean, he has been outstanding tonight. Great protection, but he throws the ball so beautifully. 15 of 19 again, 197 yards, three touchdowns, but he just surveys the field, and he's got the long ball touch. He's got the short touch. Great balance with his feet. You know, the thing about Sam Bradford, he is a much better athlete than people give him credit for. And this is a very quarterback-friendly place at Oklahoma. Kevin Wilson is actually the, the coordinator. He coaches tight ends and fullbacks, but he's coached quarterbacks before. Josh Heupel is his position coach, was a great quarterback here at Oklahoma. Gans with a fake. He'll throw underneath to Peterson. He's up to about the 36. You know, and there's another guy on the Oklahoma staff, uh, Kale Gundy, who is a running backs coach, but he was also an outstanding quarterback sure here at was. Oklahoma. So there's a lot of guys that, 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 that understand the quarterback position that have kind of all lent themselves to the development of Sam Bradford. And uh, you know, I'll tell you what, if you're a quarterback, it's a pretty good place to go. There's Josh Heupel taking a drink right now. He was one of three quarterbacks in Oklahoma history. There's Kale Gundy. Heupel, one of three who threw for over 4,000 yards in his career. Well, look at the numbers that Bradford has already put up. He's not even done with his sophomore year. By the time he's done, he could own, he could own, yeah. I mean, every record in the Big 12 and a lot of records everywhere else as well. Yeah, he is, uh, he's sharp. I mean, he's accurate. He throws the ball well. And, and, and the biggest thing that I see in him is just his, his footwork. And, and I talked to Kale Gundy before the game about it and, and Josh Heupel. And he said, you know, he's really worked hard at it and, and he's really drilled it. But his footwork and his balance is exceptional. Little bubble screen. Peterson across the 50. Holly has more on Sam Bradford. Well, guys, you're talking about what a great athlete he is, but really what might set him apart more than anything is what an amazing competitor he is. Bob Stoops has told us, you guys don't want to compete with him in anything, whether it's a game of golf. He said, if our guys split up and want to play pickup basketball, he's one of the first guys picked, not just because he's so athletic, but because he just refuses to lose. That's a quiet underlying strength of his that really permeates his football team. 
I don't think it's what you really need in your quarterback. I mean, there are, there are guys like uh, my partner, Todd Blackledge, who has that quiet persona. But I know when you were in college, you were a leader, you were a competitor. I mean, you weren't going to back down from anybody or anything. No, it's, uh, you don't have to be loud and, and outgoing to be a fiery competitor. And listen how quiet it is in the stadium. Yeah. Austin English is, is the injured player right now, one of their leaders on the defensive front, and, and it is silent here in the stadium. He's a junior from uh, 6'3", 253 pounds. Missed three games earlier, was one of the uh, best pass rushers in the country last year in the top 20 in sacks. We'll check on him when we come back. November, time to get Todd to talk Heisman. He won't do it till November 1st. The deadline's passed. We'll talk about the Heisman when we come back. ESPN's College Football Primetime is available in sparkling clear. ESPN HD. And if you've got HD, you have seen 77 crystal clear points already. <laughs> Gans is trying to add to Nebraska's total in the Oklahoma 45. Good protection pass tipped. Roy Hello Jr. got a uh, hand on it. And then Demarcus Granger got up and tipped it a little bit. And then Clayton helped break it up. Well, the timing of the throw got disrupted by the tip by Granger. And that's why Clayton was there to be able to bust up the play. Again, for Oklahoma, their focus needs to be for the rest of the time that their starting defense is on the field. We've got to be more disciplined. We, we've got to, to work on shutting down big plays getting to the quarterback and playing sound fundamental defense just to, to just to keep getting better, taking steps forward as a football team. A little misdirection play that didn't fool anybody not wearing an Oklahoma uniform. The Oklahoma defensive front, the coaches feel has played pretty solid all year. They've got depth up there and they're strong on the inside. Probably their best player, Gerald McCoy, number 93, has been their leader up front. A team high six sacks coming into the game tonight. But it's in the back end. The inexperience at yep. linebacker, some new secondary people. That's where they've had some of the issues. And this is a great opportunity against a good offensive football team to try to get these guys grown up a little bit. I mean, this unit is only 54th in the country in total defense. Gans throws, little jump pass, and he got it over the head of Roy Hello Jr. Holly has an injury update for us. Holly? Well, guys, Oklahoma is one of those schools that won't release injury information, but what I've observed is they've examined the left knee of Austin English. They've told him that he's likely done for the game. He's here on the sideline with a pack of ice on it. But just from his body language and how he's kind of pumped fifths with some of the guys that have come over, it doesn't look like it's a, a horrific injury. It may just be a slight sprain of his knee. He said, can I stand up on it? And they say, he said yes. So he's standing here on the sidelines right now. Guys, that would be a huge loss for their defense if it was anything more. Thank you, Holly. Good job. There are so many towns in Texas with great names. He's from Canadian, Texas. Well, isn't he the guy, Holly, also, that's got the, uh, he knows about pain. He's played with pain a lot through his career. Let's check in with Reese. All right, Mike, on ABC, Texas and Texas Tech, Jordan Shipley just returned a punt for a touchdown a few moments ago. It is 22 to 13. As you see, I believe that is Brian Arakpo being tended to on the field for Texas right now as Tech has it back, just picked up a first down. Game's on ABC, 22-13, nine minutes left in the third. And Texas Tech has come so close so many times, and they need one of those signature wins to really stamp that program where they want to be and nearly a breakout run as that ball was good enough for a first down there's a flag as Murray went down after a good run hey, let's go, holding Murray. offense number 79 half the distance to the goal this will come back down. all right you've held out as long as you could yeah. we're going to talk Heisman now who do you like 
Well, I, I don't have a favorite right now. I, I do think that there are certain guys, and, and three of them uh, are quarterbacks from the same league, and one's a quarterback from the SEC. You might think I'm biased being a quarterback, but uh, no. I think those are, those are some of the guys that are playing the best. Colt McCoy and Graham Harrell are going at it head-to-head -head tonight over in Lubbock. And uh, Sam Bradford, uh, I think, has put up an outstanding performance here tonight. It, it, to me, all those teams still have huge games left in the month of November. And that's when the season is really determined, the month of November. And so I think even with the Heisman guys, I think that's when that's when you're going to see who really steps up and, and wins that award. I think a lot of people thought it was kind of Colt McCoy's to win or to lose. Uh, but he's got his hands full tonight over in Lubbock. And, uh, you know, if they don't win that game and Graham Harrell's team wins, that thing could really change uh, overnight. Well, Harrell would certainly step up, yep. you know, with a big game and a huge, a huge win. Uh, the guy that has surprised me is Tim Tebow. He is certainly, and I'm sure it doesn't bother him in the slightest. Yeah. As long as they win, he's that kind of kid. He's a special person. But he certainly hasn't put up the kind of numbers that he had last year or that would inspire Heisman talk. Right, yeah, definitely not the same kind of year. They're not asking him to do as much. I mean, he's managing the game more instead of making all the plays. And uh, they've, they've infused some new speed into their backfield. They're doing some different things yeah. offensively, but he's managing the game very well. Bradford complete over the middle. Quentin Chaney makes the catch. He was hit by Thanars, but not until he got the first down. And we talk about this Oklahoma offense and how good I think they are. I've not seen Florida in person yet, but I think their offense is playing extremely well right now. Really, uh, over the last three or four weeks, their offense has become very explosive. Well, you mentioned that speed. They put speed in the backfield yep. instead of having it on the outside. And Chaney limps off the field. 5.41 to go third quarter. A new set of downs for Oklahoma, and the clock is a huge ally for them. And Chris Brown stoned at the line of scrimmage. Here's Holly. Where, guys, this is where injuries can start to creep up with a big lead and bodies flying around both. But Quentin Cheney just came out. He's complaining of pain on his right knee. He's already got a, a sleeve on that. It's been a pre-existing problem for him, but it looks like he's walking around. He's going to try to get back out there. But DeMarco Murray came out. He's holding his back, the left side of his back. They've taken him over to take a look at him, guys. That's not a good sign. Well, Holly, it's uh, there's a penalty for an illegal substitution against Oklahoma that'll back him up. We have gotten to that point in the season where people's depth are is going to be tested yeah. because more and more guys get hurt as the season wears along. And now we have a 12-game regular season in college football. Plus, if you have a conference championship game, there's that. So there's 13 games before you get to a ball game. There's going to be a lot of guys hurt. And this is probably the time also, uh, you know, with the kind of lead that they have, I don't know how much longer Bob Stoops will keep Sam Bradford and the starters in. Here's the guy that was hurt a minute ago. He looks okay right now. Cheney's not <laughs> limping anymore. 48 yards and another perfect strike from Bradford, who has had immaculate protection. Great protection. Watch his feet. Watch how balanced he is. Balance right up underneath him, and then he throws a strike. Again, we've talked about this over the last couple weeks. The difference between a quarterback who can hit his receivers in stride, where they can catch it and keep running, is a, is a very special thing. Not all quarterbacks do that very well. This guy does it extremely well. Cheney having a huge night, five catches, 128 yards. He only had 14 grabs coming in. Bob Stoops has to be pleased, at least with his offense, of their continued intensity and focus here in the third quarter. If they can get another score in here to right before the end of the third quarter, it might be time to, uh, to put in some of the backups and uh, rest these guys. They've got a game next week against Texas A&M. Well, they've only scored 56, Tom. Yeah, well. We've hit the four-minute mark. Bradford again throws this one away. You know, Bob Stoops has been, there's a flag down on the play. Bob Stoops has been so successful here. I think that people lose track of the fact that this team had struggled before he came. In the 10 years before Bob Stoops, Holding, Holding. offense number 72, 10-yard penalty, repeat second down. That's on Duke Robinson. 
In the 10 years prior to Bob's arrival here, they were 61, 50, and 3, and only went to three bowl games. So he has turned it around big time. And once you're successful, people just sort of take yeah. it for granted that, hey, everything's all right, has been for a long time, and we ought to win everything yeah. every year. Doesn't work that way. And especially the people here in Norman. I mean, they're 58-2 and two at home here in Norman <laughs> under Bob Stoops. They haven't lost a conference game here at home since they lost to Oklahoma State back in 2001. They lost that game 16-13. to 13. Every other game in the Big 12 Conference here at home, they've won. Great pass coverage by Blake Lawrence. Crowd wanted a flag, but Bradford is totally unmolested in this second half. I mean, there aren't people within six or seven yards yeah. of them, and the only way you're going to have an incompletion is if somebody makes a big defensive play. Nobody again within five yards, and it's just pitch and catch to Iglesias. If you can't put any pressure on a quarterback, I mean, you're you're dead meat. Let's check in with Reese. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. My apologies. What we have here is a 56 to 21 game. Oklahoma leads and driving. Oklahoma trying to be. A team that moves up in the rankings if Texas loses to Texas Tech. Everybody is going to be anxious to move up if number one goes down tonight. And it will certainly make the Big 12 South incredibly interesting. I mean, there are four teams that are national championship contenders in this league that are all in the same division. Only one of them is going to have a chance to play for a title against whoever happens to win the North. Sometimes life's just unfair. Yeah. <laughs> Clock running, 2.59 to go in the third quarter. It's second and nine. Oklahoma has already scored more points than it had ever scored against Nebraska. And here's Holly. Well, guys, part of this no huddle and the offense that Oklahoma is running this year has to be based on execution. Well, these are A marks for the execution of the signal, guys. I see Kale Gundy, Josh Heifel, one other coach over here. Guys, they're like the temptation. It is fists <laughs> flying, hips going, elbows all over the place. Man, they're doing a great yeah. job, on, especially when they speed up the tempo. Yeah, I wonder if Debbie Allen does any work with <laughs> choreographing the uh, the signals. Holly, that's a great observation. Bradford for the end zone. Iglesias had it tipped away, and it's intercepted by Thanars. <laughs> tipped by Armando Murillo. Got a hand in there, and the first thing that Bradford's done wrong all night yeah. long. Ball looked like it may have been a little bit behind Iglesias. He has been on target with everything. He's got the protection. The ball is a little bit behind Iglesias, and that allowed Murillo to get his hand on the football. And a rare turnover for this Oklahoma offense. Again, this is a team that that's only their eighth turnover for the entire season. So now the crowd into it. They want the defense to stand up and stop Nebraska. Although they can hardly be threatened at this point. There's a fumble. Bad exchange between Gans and Quentin Castile. And Oklahoma's got it. The fourth turnover. So their defense makes a play. And on the first play from scrimmage after that, they fumble it away. This is never a clean exchange between Gans and Castile. Castillo never has it tucked away before he tries to run into the line of scrimmage and one play and the Nebraska offense back off the field. It was turnovers early that did them in and a turnover right now that just wiped out the interception by their defense. Mm. Oklahoma's too good to give them any yeah. turnovers, let alone four. 
And Bradford will go right back to work. And that makes Nebraska now minus nine on the season in turnover margin. I mean, that's uh, it's hard to be successful when you're on the, uh, the negative side of that statistic. Murray gets five. Well, Holly was talking about the signals and uh, how they do this no huddle offense. It was interesting. Kevin Wilson, who calls the plays from upstairs, kind of said that he, he treats it almost like he's a point guard in basketball. And he watches his players and he watches the defensive players to try to decide when to speed up, when to slow down. And some of those signals that come in tell them what the snap count is and how fast we're going to play. Bradford for the end zone and should have been caught. Yeah. Off the fingertips of Ryan Broyles. That was a beautiful throw. Oh. Right over the outside shoulder, away from the defender. Can't sort of throw it any better. It. Yeah, a little bit he did. I mean, that should have been an easy pitch and catch. You're right, it was a perfect throw by Sam Bradford. Now it's third and seven. Murray trying to use the speed. There's going to be a hold on this play as Murray got to the corner. Very often you'll see the tight end, this case Gresham, just grab that defensive end and try to secure the corner. Number 18, 10-yard penalty, repeat third down. If they decline it, it would be fourth and three. But they will take the penalty and back him back to the 25. I don't know, as good as Bradford is, I don't know if I want to give yeah, him two I more know. shots. Make it now third and 17. You know, there's an interesting thing about the way this field is set up. If you're a receiver and you're running into the end zone, the deep part of the end zone, you, you got to be aware of where that wall is. Yeah. That wall is very close. And, of course, guys go down there and work out earlier in the end zone. And you see any padding on that? <laughs> Those are bricks, folks. And if you've got a full head of steam going there, there's not much room to slow down. And that's the kind of thing a receiver will notice in warm-ups and think to himself, uh-oh. <laughs> there's no give in that thing. Note to self, slow down <laughs> when you get outside of the red yeah. there. Feed mayonnaise to tuna <laughs> and slow down. Oh Underneath, gosh, nobody, nobody, nobody saw it. home. He came out of the backfield and absolutely nobody accounted for him. That's not supposed to happen. Well, like I said before, when they score, they have made it look so easy. And Nebraska's helped them make it look easy. And look at Bo just shaking his head. There's Dillard, the middle linebacker. He would love to be in there to help. Now that was a bust there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's just a bust. Bradford five touchdown passes. He had five against Cincinnati. And the extra point is no good. Bradford's pass for 311 yards and the score is 62 21. Well, here's Murray. He's just going to run a little crossing route out of the backfield. Watch the, the Nebraska defense is just going to part and nobody even <laughs> sees him. Nobody even goes anywhere near him. That's too easy for Sam Bradford. DeMarco Murray crossed right in front of his face, five yards deep. You get it to him on the move, and it's an easy touchdown. Tomorrow afternoon on ABC, Jimmy Johnson steering closer to his third straight Sprint Cup title. Carl Edwards the rest of the chase field trying to hold him back. The chase for the Sprint Cup continues with the Dickies 500 at Texas tomorrow on ABC. Coverage starts with NASCAR countdown at 3 Eastern. Well, they're going to have to go back and water the ponies, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, that one on the left looked like he was ready to take it on in. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> he was ready to head for the yeah. barn. Where's the barn, baby? Yeah. I've had enough of this. And they, we've still got 44 seconds to go in the quarter. Previous high for Oklahoma against Nebraska ever, 55 points. Tonight they've already hung 62 on them. Niles Paul is deep to receive. Moreland's going to have leg fatigue just from kicking off. Paul runs into his own man, or this would have been a bigger return. Got up to the 29, and here's Reese. Mike Sports Center right now. Florida State is claimed to being the best one-loss team in America by drilling Georgia 49 to 10. A little payback for the festivities last year. And the game on ABC right now, Texas and Texas Tech. Daniel Charbonnet picked off Colt McCoy, returned it for a touchdown. 29-13, Red Raiders lead, getting late in the third. Sports Center after the game. Stay current with ESPN News. You know, we were, we were talking earlier, Texas Tech in the last few years has had this high-powered offense, and they have come very, very close yeah. to that signature win that would take them from a team that most people see as a sort of a system team, right. a, a high-scoring team that's not going to win the big games because they don't play enough defense, they're not tough enough, blah, 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 whatever the reason you come up with. If they beat Texas after the teams Texas has beaten, the stamp of, you know, we're good is on them. But, you know, the interesting thing about that is it's their defense this year that's giving yes. it a chance. It's their defense that gives them a chance. And, and a lot of these high-powered offenses, I even think of like a Florida when they won the national championship. It was Bob Stoops' defense that got the Gators a championship. And defense is what they have not had before. That could be a special team. Welcome back to ESPN College Football Primetime, presented by Hampton Hotels. It is 62-21. Most points scored in a conference game since Oklahoma beat Texas A&M 77-zip. Well, earlier they were projected to get 200 and something. Fortunately, they're going to be held under that. Here's Holly Rowe with an equine update. Well, guys, I've been a little concerned about Boomer and Sooner because they've had a lot of work tonight. There's been so much scoring. They've been on the field a lot. I went and checked with their driver, Tyler Silas. He said, you know, the good news is that they get a conditioning program at the farm that they're on. They do a lot of running in the corral. I didn't get their measurements as far as body fat, bench press, or squat or anything. Yeah. But uh, they're quite lean. They're not breathing hard. And he said he thinks they're going to be OK. Yeah, I don't know which one's Boomer and which one's Sooner, but that one on the left was not pulling his whole weight the last time <laughs> around. He, he was letting the other one do most of the work. Gans goes down at the 20. Rare quarterback pressure. Price making out of Corpus Christi. Gets his second sack of the year. I understand PETA has called to say, uh, you know, enough already. Give him a carrot and send him home. Beautiful animal. You know, the funny thing, too, is every time before they score, they fire a cannon or something, and those two horses jump each Just time. Just like too. I do. Yeah. You'd think they'd be used to it by now. No, you never get used to cannons. Royals. Feet go out from under him. He's down at the 40-yard line. Seven-yard return after a punt of 46. Plenty of sugar and maybe some oats tonight, boys. Let's take a look at the ESPNU All-State Standings Review, and it starts at the top. It is November, after all. Will number one go down tonight? They're behind seventh-ranked Texas Tech, 29-13. to 13. Alabama blew away Arkansas State as expected. Penn State was off, which may hurt them. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously, the, the Texas-Texas Tech game really kind of holds the key to to all the movement that will yes. take place. One of those teams already moving down and out of there is Georgia after getting dismantled today by Florida. 
Joey Halsley, by the way, the new quarterback. 6'3", a senior out of Huntington Beach, California. He's only thrown 22 passes this year. Was outstanding when he had a chance to play against Texas Tech last season. Threw for 291 yards in that game. In the backfield with him, Clapp and Mo Moses Madu, and they're going to blow this play dead. Take a look at what the top three in the BCS have left. Dead ball foul, offside defense, number 98, five yard penalty, still second down. Keeping in mind all the upsets last year, but Texas against Baylor, Kansas, and Texas A&M, the Kansas game could be very, very interesting for them, uh, especially if they drop out of the number one spot, which they certainly would with the loss tonight. Number two, Alabama still has to play LSU still has to play Auburn and Mississippi State with an excellent defensive team, but no offense. Penn State, that Michigan game is looming larger and yeah, larger. Michigan State, yeah. I tell you what, next week at Iowa is not going to be an easy game for Penn State either. Iowa has always played Penn State well. The other thing that's going to hurt Penn State, I think, I mean, being off tonight uh, might hurt them a little bit right. in how this thing shapes up after the end of this weekend. But the fact that after Michigan State, there's no championship game in the Big Ten or the Pac-10, I think that hurts Penn State potentially. I think it hurts USC also as a one-loss team because too. the Big 12 and the SEC, if a team goes undefeated in that and, and they, even a one-loss team and, and wins the championship in one of those conferences, they get one more game and one more uh, chance to play on a big stage. Penn State after November 22nd, they're done. They're at home watching everybody else play. And because strength of schedule plays a part in the final rankings, both Penn State and Southern Cal are at a disadvantage because of their conference and weaknesses. ESPN's College Football Primetime is presented by Hampton Hotels. At Hampton, we love having you here. And in part by Mercury oh, yeah. and your local Lincoln Mercury dealers. Welcome back to Norman, Oklahoma, one of the shrines of college football, where the seniors are laying one on Nebraska 62 to 21. And the second team quarterback, Joey Halsley, is in there for the Sooners. Facing a third and two on his side to the 50. And that'll be enough for a first down from Moses, Moses Madu as Pierre Allen makes the tackle. Some new offensive linemen in there as well for Oklahoma. John Cooper, the starting center, is still in, as is Trent Williams, the right tackle. But new guys in. The other three Legal spots. Block, block on the offense, number four came back towards the ball, made a block below the waist. 15-yard penalty, repeat third down. There's the illegal block. Jameel Owens. A young receiver getting uh, his chance to get in the game now, a freshman. Ball moved back to the 35-yard line. Blitz coming on Halsley. They throw the screen. Madu will be taken down around the 40. Backups in for Oklahoma. Starting defense still on the field for Nebraska. Bo Pelini wanting to, uh, now here comes the substitutes now. Actually, it's a punt team, punting, <laughs> so it's not subs. He's oh, maybe the substitute punting. Yeah, right. No, I think some substitute uh, announcers here in a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Anytime, bring them on. <laughs> Swift will go back to his 20. I think that hit an Oklahoma player. I think it did too. It will be covered by Nebraska in the end zone regardless. 
And the Oklahoma players are signaling, trying to make a case that it touched a Nebraska player, but I don't think they'll win this one. There was an Oklahoma and a Nebraska player down there, and I thought it hit an Oklahoma player right on the helmet and bounced towards the end zone. And it would be an illegal First touch. touching by the kicking team. Yep. So they'll they get the right. ball at the spot where it was touched. Doink right there. <laughs> Brandon Caleb. That sound will get your attention when uh -huh. you're not looking. Boy, hello, Junior, across the 25, and here's Reese. All right, Mike and Todd, Texas, not quite done yet. In Lubbock, Colt McCoy to Malcolm Williams. Slips a couple of tackles, gone. Two-point conversion, not successful. It's a 10-point game as they go to the fourth quarter. Red Raiders leading number one, Texas, on ABC. Well, you know Colt McCoy's not going to give up. Right. He is just an unbelievable talent who's had an incredible year. Hello again. We'll get about three on this, leaving a third down. Oh, the Big 12 is, uh, is virtually decided, uh, divided into have and have nots in the north, although Missouri and Kansas have been pretty good. Uh, they have fallen back from the uh, top four, and the top four are all in the south. Texas, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma. Just tremendous seasons for all four of those ball clubs, and yet only one of them yeah. is going to come out of the south to play in the Big 12 championship game. Gans with good protection this time. Pump fake trying to keep alive. Flag is down. He completes the pass to Swift. Even though uh, that, that is true, only one of those teams can come out to play in the championship game. There is an interesting scenario, and now obviously Texas has got their hands full right now, but even if Texas would come back and win, Oklahoma, even though they Holding. would not get to the championship game. Holding. Offense, number 65, 10-yard penalty for line of scrimmage. Repeat, third down. Try again. Even though they could not get to the championship game, there is a scenario where they could still find their way in the BCS championship game. And uh, that, that's not completely out of the realm of possibility. There is no stipulation that you have to play in your championship game of your conference or be your conference champion to play in the championship game. And... Uh, so Oklahoma, obviously, their main focus is not necessarily who wins or who loses around them. They just need to take care of their own business well, right now. Part of that scenario would be if you didn't get into the championship game and the other team did and they lost right. in the championship game and you were close enough, you would have a chance to skip over them right. and be the higher rated team. Now, if there is a tie in either division, the highest rated team in the BCS standings goes to the championship game. So the BCS standings are going to be far more important than the, the standings themselves right. in the South if there is a tie. And speaking of streaks ending, Michigan, after 33 straight years of going to a bowl game, will not be bowl eligible this year. That is the longest streak in the nation and their loss today put them out of contention for that. When we come back, we'll take a look at tonight's photo album, New Technology Meets Old Fashioned Images. Coming up next on ESPN, stay tuned for Sports Center. Some of the stories they'll be following game day. More from Lubbock. Bob Knight's game day picks and Saturday's top playmakers. Good to have Bob Knight back. Toby Keith. He's as good once as he ever was. <laughs> Don't give me that funny look. Madhu across the 40. If you joined us late, here is tonight's photo album. Oh. 
Whoa, big fella. They're hoping for a scoreless eight minutes and eight six seconds. Madhu can't get outside. Holly Rowe. Well, as we mentioned earlier in this show, oh, we've got a flag. Let me have you talk about that. Bo's still working the sidelines. Well, he was in the face of Terrence Moore, a Step freshman. Foul. Personal foul, unnecessary roughest on the defense. Number 90, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Okay, Holly, back to you. All right, sorry about that. Well, earlier we told you about that uh, Bo Pelini and Bob Stoops, their families are well-connected, grew up together in Youngstown, went to the same high school, and they're lifelong friends. Well, when Bo Pelini was a young redshirt freshman playing at Ohio State, he got injured. He was down, he was homesick, and he said, Bob Stoops was coaching at Iowa. He caught wind of that, that I was, you know, having some negative thoughts. And he called me and he said, look, I'm going to tell you what my dad taught me years ago. You get back in there. You fight. You quit feeling sorry for yourself and go back to work. I have a feeling that maybe some of those words of advice will come back after tonight's game. Boy, that's a good observation, too. Madhu out in the flat really didn't have a chance. He was taken down before he could catch stride. Amu Kamara made the tackle. And Bo Pelini really letting the officials yeah. have it on that last penalty call. He didn't well, like that yeah, one. And bit. here's the thing. Bo Pelini is also, I mean, he's not putting on a show, but he is trying to set an example for his team of yeah. saying, you know what, I'm not going to quit. I, I, I yeah. don't care what the score is. I'm going to coach until the very end of this game, and then we'll get on the plane, and we'll go back to Lincoln, and we'll start over again tomorrow after we watch the tape. But I'm not going to just cash it in and mail it in and just let it happen, whatever happened. We are going to fight every play that we can. Point officials. <laughs> officials just yeah. stand there and get an earful sometimes. You got to be uh, half deaf sometimes. Just stand there and let them vent. Six twenty-three here in the fourth quarter. Third and eight. Getting into Nebraska territory. Bradford's night is done. Halsley, the quarterback. Halsley wants to throw out in the flat, incomplete, intended for Brandon Caleb. Got a red zone alert for Texas and Texas Tech as the Red Raiders are driving again on number one. I mean, seriously, if you're still watching us, do you really care about Texas, Texas Tech? <laughs> I think you're more interested in Nebraska and Oklahoma. On the eve of this year's presidential election, two of the NFL's elite will face off at the nation's capital. You can cast your vote for the Steelers or the Redskins. And don't miss halftime. Chris Berman will be joined by Barack Obama and John McCain. One of your last chances to hear the candidates. There they are right now to go to uh, the polls on Tuesday. Monday Night Football on ESPN at 8.30. Really remarkable job this year by the Redskins. Yeah, Tim Jason Zorn, Camp huh? Dahl. He's done a remarkable job, and Jason Campbell, who looked so bad at the end of the preseason and the start of the regular season, has been spectacular since that first game loss to the Giants. Yeah, the Redskins' defense continues to play well as they had before, but it's the offense, and Portis has, has been tremendous yeah. as a running back. 
Yeah, you know, with, with Portis, I mean, you, he's kind of a known commodity. You know what you have with him. Absolutely. I mean, the, the unknown was Jason Campbell and how consistent he would play, but uh, he's done a nice job so far. The other coaches would come in and say, all we need to do, they wouldn't say all, but it was basically, if we take away his first receiver, we've got it. Yeah. And that was true during the preseason in that first game. But since then, he has been able to find his second and third receiver. He has shown escapability in the pocket. He's just done a beautiful job. And they have been so stingy about not turning the ball over. Patrick Witt, the new quarterback, the red shirt freshman, getting a chance to play a little bit here as both coaches have turned it over to their second teams. You know, the one thing I'll say about Oklahoma tonight is uh, I think offensively they did everything we expected them to do. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to stop them is, is their offense themselves if they turn it over. Defensively, I, I do think that they played better tonight. I really think defensively, even though they gave up 21 points in Nebraska, you know, they gave up 28 in the first half last week to Kansas State. And... Uh, you know, they gave up a lot of big plays, more big plays than they gave up tonight. I thought they were more sound fundamentally on defense tonight. And the one guy who's still in there, number 12, playing middle linebacker, Austin Box, I mean, he's still in the game because he needs game experience. I mean, he's the new middle Absolutely. linebacker. He's a redshirt freshman. He was a high school quarterback where he grew up in Enid, Oklahoma. And so he just needs to be on the field and play. The more he can see, the more he can feel, the better he will be as they get into, you know, the, the, the latter part of their, their season and their schedule because they need him to step up and be a big-time player. Dan Titchener will kick it out. Royals will make the fair catch at the 38-yard line upon 44. No return. 4:01 to go in Norman. Come on, Mom. I don't want to go home yet. I mean, we've only got 62. Let's stick around, try to get some more. Today's National College Football Day. Five years ago, the AT&T Cotton Bowl Classic created this holiday to honor the birth of college football. And for the third straight year, they have teamed up with the V Foundation to raise money for cancer research. You can contribute to the V Foundation on behalf of National Football Day by calling 1-800-4-JIMMY-V or online at jimmyv.org. Holly Rowe, what do you have? Well, guys, the way the Oklahoma sideline is set up, they're facing this electronic board right across from them. And just a moment ago, they flashed up that Texas, Texas Tech game. Texas is now 26. I think they've pulled within three points. A collective groan emitted from this whole stadium. The players keep glancing up at it at two, boy. All eyes are on Texas, believe me. Let's check in with Reese Davis. Hey, Mike, tell Holly to stop trying to render me obsolete. Here's the Texas touchdown she was talking about. The Longhorns had just blocked a field goal, and on the first play, Colt McCoy to Malcolm Williams. 91 yards, still 11 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Texas Tech starting to feel the pressure. The lead's three. All right, Reese. Well, Holly's trying, you know. I mean, the more you She's can do, the more valuable you are. That's right. Yep, she is. And she was wearing that blue wig last yep. night. <laughs> well, a couple of the one-loss teams making pretty strong statements today in college football. The Florida Gators, the Oklahoma Sooners, USC with a big win. The month of November is going to Really be interesting, just like it was last year. I mean, that was one of the craziest months ever in college football. Promises to be a similar finish this year. It was the most unbelievable November. And we've been watching college football for quite a while. Most yeah. unbelievable no November I ever saw. And if this is even 10% of what last year was, it would be interesting. Here's what lies ahead for Oklahoma, that Texas Tech game. Yeah, well, look, they got an open week before that, too, which yeah. is good for, 
for Oklahoma, preparing for that offensive Texas Tech. And then they've got to play Oklahoma State, not only a, a huge rivalry game, but the number nine team yeah. in the country. This conference just so loaded with tremendous ball clubs. And it all goes to what you were talking about earlier. It's a league of quarterbacks, just so many tremendous quarterbacks. And you can run, you can run some, any kind of offense that you want if you have a guy that can deliver the ball. Yeah. I think I was uh, I think I was reading that eight of the uh, eight quarterbacks in the Big 12 coming into today, eight of the top of the quarterbacks in the Big 12 were ranked in the top 22 of pass efficiency yes. this season. I mean, that, that's it's amazing. I mean, uh, we knew coming into the year that it was uh, the league that had the best quarterbacks, but they have even played at an even higher level. And you've got the you know, the upper level guys and two of which are, or three of which are Heisman candidates in Colt McCoy, Graham Harrell, and Sam Bradford. But even the, the next level guys, the Joe Ganses and the, the Josh Freemans at Kansas State. Last week, Josh Freeman threw for a career high 479 against Oklahoma. Watch out, watch out. And here goes Roy Hellu Jr. with another good run. This kid has really shown some ability to get outside and shown tackle breaking ability as well. He gets 57 yeah. on this one. You know, looking at him on the field before the game, he's not a very big guy. He's not a stocky back, but he's got some strength in his lower body and he's got that speed. Poor tackling by Oklahoma at the point of attack. And then he makes him pay on the outside. They didn't get him on the ground. And he doesn't look that fast, but every no. time you look up, he's running by people. 15 carries for 154 yards tonight. That's a pretty decent night's work. He'll get the carry again. You would have thought they'd have gone somewhere else <laughs> after it just ran for 54 yards. Clock is running. We're under a minute. He's saying, come on, man. <laughs> I'm still gasping for air after that one. Throw the thing. Well, we always said this about the SEC. If you can get through the SEC with one loss and win it, you're probably the best team in the country. You get the idea this year, if you get through the Big 12, with one loss. You're probably the best team in the country. And there's the quarterback, Patrick Witt, after the yeah. fake, and he's got the touchdown. Yeah. Everybody went for uh, for the tailback on the zone read. Hello was the guy everybody went and tackled. Watch the Oklahoma defense crash in on the back. Nobody picked up the quarterback, and then a nice block on the outside. Hunter Tifa Tiller, yep. the tight end. Well executed play by the backup quarterback, Witt. His first touchdown of the year. His previous long run had been a yard. And there are giant grasshoppers flying in a, into our booth. The size of Cessnas. Nebraska, we knew coming in offensively that they could move the ball and score, but from their very first play of the game, they had turnover problems. That was a touchdown. This resulted in another Oklahoma scoring drive, but the early turnovers, three in their first five possessions, just dug Nebraska such a deep hole, there was no way that they could get out of. I mean, that Oklahoma is too good of a football team to help them by turning the football over, and uh, that's what caused so much angst for Bo Pelini early in the game. I mean, he knew defensively they would have to play almost a perfect game to be in the game. Their only chance was to, to win in a shootout to outscore Oklahoma, but you can't do that if you turn it over when you have the football. Well, we certainly didn't expect 62 to 28. Iglesias took a knee at the 21. Nebraska will still need a victory to be bowl eligible. I have the feeling they're going to get that. I mean, Bo Pelini 
We've seen enough coaches over the years. There are certain guys that just have it. Yeah. Whatever it is, they can coach, they can recruit, they are special, and whether you can quantify it or qualify it, you know it when you see it. Yeah. And he's got it. Yeah, I agree. He'll get it done there. And uh, they've got the resources, they've got the backing, they've got the support. He's just got to get for more players. And, and you know, again, they, they've recruited players to fit a certain system under Bill Callahan for the last several years, and it's not necessarily the way that, that Bo Pelini wants to play. And no. So he's got to recruit players to fit what he wants to do on both sides of the football, and that you can't do that overnight. And uh, It'll take him a little bit of time, but he is, he'll get it done. When Steve Peterson, who was the athletic director, passed him over the first time, he was the defensive coordinator, just about everybody there thought it was a terrible mistake. Yeah. It turned out to be one. Uh, they tried to change the culture of the program. They shut out older players. They, they made a whole bunch of changes, all of which blew up in their face, basically. But he'll get it done. Bo Pelini is going to be a tremendous head coach for this ball club. And he told us, he said, what we want to do is we want to get our program to where Oklahoma's is yeah. right now. That's the program to model after. And where Oklahoma is right now is pretty good. Oklahoma wins it tonight, 62 to 28. Coming up next, stay tuned for Sports Center for a wrap up of this game. Catch us on ESPN News in just a few minutes. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Todd Blackledge, Holly Rowe, and our entire ESPN crew, this is Mike Patrick. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night, boys, and good night from Norman.